You might have a different idea. Okay, let's how this goes. Yeah, we're going to go back to the start of the birth of Renan and Ralph Hines. And that is 2021. And you can see that was part of the barony of Uppercross. And you can see that Renan and Ralph Hines, Harris Cross, Milton, etc., were all part of that. And after the Act of Union, and particularly after the um, famine, Great landlords left the country in, in large measure. And along the way, sometimes they sold and, and, and did development themselves, but more often they actually sold on to other landlords who then, um, over time, divided their land into parcels and planned them very roughly, um, showing streets and lanes, which rose and building costs. There was no master plan. And um, further developers were then sought to construct houses on the plots under contract, under long leaseholds, and subject to grant rents. Note, only when the work was underway did the landowner or the new transfer of rat mines or always fights between them provide the water and sewage and pipe up and pave the roads. So actually, the houses were first, and the sewage and infrastructure often came second. The Rat Mines Township was established by Frederick Stokes, an Englishman, and other developers to avoid the city's high rates. It wasn't a noble beginning, and was uh, proposed as a constant enclave, essentially, and there's no provision made for the core. So, it's as well to know. Um, Patrick, but the Catholics soon got into the game, in fact, and it, became, it became very quickly dominated by Catholic supporters um, and developers. They mainly came from the um, commercial shopkeeper class. And in fact, you know, the shopkeeper class who got access to, to land in terms of long leaseholds, etc., allowed um, uh, capital to build up in that community, um, which enabled subsequently, I think, the land struggle and the essentially uh, our uh, eventual liberty. You know, one, seemed, you know, one tends to think that it was all done by the rural peasants. It wasn't. It was the new Catholic middle class that led that struggle. Anyway, Patrick Muffet, a Catholic by an old landlord, a leader of Richard County Road, couldn't get the township to provide services to the as well. So he actually blocked the road and didn't let, didn't let anybody build on it um, to finally get the sewer down the road. So that's the kind of the struggles that were there. It wasn't, as they say, not just the beginning see. So, um, the relations were fraught, as I say. Um, Carson had to build down uh, the sewer and Marlborough Road, which show, I'll show you the contract. Uh, we have a contract from Honor Burlicon, who I really have to thank for a lot of the backstory, because she's descended from builder developers on both sides, not three, three or four sides, and knows intimately what happened and the kind of family stories behind the buildings that are now we're so familiar with. So Belgrade's were 20 years to finish because the township did not pay for upkeep. I think it was a question of taking in charge. I'm not sure. Um, but you can see how the uh, plots were laid out and there were groups of plots, maybe six, seven, three, four, different sizes to make it doable for the builder developers uh, to take on. The land for the churches and schools was donated by wealthy parishioners. This has to be remembered that they're looking to sell at top dollar to the private market. Um, first, it was mainly Protestant landowners, but then the Catholic um, um, local people donated to religious order orders to provide to the churches and other services in the area. So it was very much a collective effort. So this shows um, the development of Hamilton Road area. I live in the middle of it, but that's entirely by chance. 
So you can see in 1907, the Pachamas see the houses on large plots, uh, and then you can see the beginning of terraces backing onto green fields, no lanes, not necessary. Um, many of those large houses that end on the bigger estates on the divide, they were quite grand, and um, Brathline's castle had to be demolished to make um, Armstrong Park. And you can see there, see that diagonal line coming down, that's a north town path. That's important to remember, I'll talk to you about that later. So two, two years on, a great deal of Brathline's remnant was built. That's pretty fast, considering, you know, they didn't have machines. Um, and it was built to high density, and it was built to high quality. So there were mainly terraces on narrow plots with back lanes, some semi detached on wide plots. We could see near, near the uh, out of park in particular, but that was just beginning in the later years. And then right up to 2019, 112 years later, um, yes, more, more on the um, terraces, but rather more, but they're more kind of backland, leftover. Uh, sites have got developed, and you can see the beginning of apartment blocks on shared sites. But I think their density and their quality, um, you can see that the original builders there, without a master plan, I have to say, produced really excellent environment that has retained its value and its quality to this day. Okay. So how was the paper? Um, something's missing here. Anyway, uh, so one of the um, one of the pictures in the was a picture of Harbour Road, and this is from a document that Honor Broadcom had of the original agreement between the builder developer and, and the landlord. So he was getting seven plots around eight meters wide and thirty-eight meters long, no upfront cost, no payment for three years. Okay. Uh, 999 year leases, these are secure leases, like, they're not 99 year leases, they're not like British leases where you're, you're actually coming to an end, you know, 999 year is perpetual, essentially. And the ground rent paid twice yearly when it started. You had to insure the house within three months of completion for £400, presumably that, that was the kind of level of house they wanted, that quality of houses. And a fixed round rent of 7.7% uh, price of the building. I hope I'm right in that. It's quite hard to actually interpret the clauses in the archaic uh, English with, with no paragraphs at full stops, I like to say. So the builder builds and pays the round rent as he goes, essentially. So there's no building cost to finance, ultimately, apart from the first building. I mean, this matters. Um, and then he ended up, in many cases, living in one house, sell three, pay off all the living costs, keep three and rent them out. And that established the, you know, the wealth of many families of uh, Catholic children, the Catholic retail class moved into the professional class as they built those houses. This was a very efficient way of getting stuff built quick. When there wasn't much money around, you had landlords with land, the capital was tied up in land, no income. You had shopkeepers, um, uh, loan makers, small manufacturers who had cash flow but no access to bank lending. So, the downside is, of course, if the grand rent isn't paid, the landlord can take a over the whole shebang. But the, the grand rent was not successful, as you will see. And there were other clauses as well that ensured that the building would be kept in well repair, etc., um, etc. Et so, um, now we come to a long period of time in the past. And um, right from about the 1930s, 40s, discussions about abolishing the grand rent started in earnest. This I found from a doll date in 1960. Very, very interesting. I have to say, more interesting in the corridor than most of the old debates today. So, there were two sides to it, and it didn't fall into the usual camps, as you might say. Um, first of all, they said that we should abolish the right to charge rent at all, and the landlords would no longer get any compensation for the profit which the law would entitle them to earn. 
Um, she says it was a purely a, a theoretical objection to argue that the abolition of landlords would increase the initial cost of the house purchase. <coughs> and then he says people who own property on the outskirts of our cities wouldn't have made the loss of profits they made in, in grand rents. Developers were still selling on grand rents in the 1960s. There was an upfront cost partly for, for the land, but then there was a further grand rent. And it were not for the fact that the Oroptus introduced many acts which enable people on limited means to purchase their house, um, it would have been possible. So he effectively says that the investment in the grand rent is a deadweight dead investment which will produce nothing new, it's not productive. It doesn't produce houses, it doesn't produce houses, it does not produce services. Essentially, he's saying that paying for land, increasing land value, doesn't pay for land doesn't make anything new, it pay for an existing problem. Um, now there was a problem, Mr. Burns said, the newly built houses were, were subject to much higher, higher ground rents. Uh, and that's un undesirable, but they needed the houses. But he felt that it was unreasonable when the landowner should be in a position to exploit the need for public housing. He had no moral right at all. Just because of their scarcity, they were saying, that it is not right that you should charge a higher land rent. Okay, that one. So, and then on the other side, uh, we had Mr. Cruz and Fianna Fáil, who was saying that um, if you got rid of, if no new ground rents could be created, and anyone developing a building site would have to charge more as capital sum for each house, it would increase the amount of deposit you have to pay, it would increase the staff duty, the conveyance, and increase the amount of money you'd have to raise by way of a mortgage and start to do on that again. So the builder had to get his money from somewhere. If he can get it by creating a rent, which is really no burden, it was not high still, it was higher than before, but it was not high, to a tenant, he's doing good day's work, not only for himself, but the prospective purchaser as well. So they went on to discuss about the notion that having a grand landlord helps keep place maintained and there are rules and strictures that actually benefit everybody. And he said the bad thing about tenants is they also have restrictions on neighbours but are very resentful about restrictions on themselves. I think mean, he's still it didn't have it. So um, so for the month of a, a ten pound a year grand rent um, really they were getting benefits that they weren't recognizing. And then he also says at the very end, that some grand rents are held by trust funds, and in fact, the leading Irish insurance companies are buying an increasing amount of grand rents in the city. So they were seen as valuable. Okay, hold that in your head. So what have we learned? We learned that grand rent enabled entrepreneurs to build housing developments cheaply and quickly. It substantially reduced the upfront cost for home purchases to right up into the 1960s until it was, it started being abolished, it took a little while to get abolished up to the uh, 1978 impact. It transformed an asset into a secure stream of income that's attractive to long-term investors, even though it's quite small. It captures the values created by taxes spent on infrastructures and subsidies to buyers. So any subsidies that goes into providing social housing or a hat, for instance, gets captured in the land rent, they saw it as a land rent, but in fact, it got captured in, in the land value. Whether it's the capital value or the rental value of the land, it gets captured. It's a form of tax which the private landowner could, could impose. When abolished, the price of land simply went up to compensate landowners for that loss. loss. And that is indisputable. It was after the 1960s that we got the most egregious um, uh, corruption in uh, planning in, in Dublin. Um, it's, uh, essentially, politicians corrupted so that they get permissions to build developments and so on, mainly on the outskirts of the city. But homeowners, now that they have the ground rent, possess a valuable asset, which could be realised subject to a modest ground rent. That is a possibility. And we can see without the, the landlord, in many cases, and I'll show you next, many heritage houses are badly subdivided in poor repair, vacant, and underused. You wouldn't be 
leaving a house vacant or underused with the grand landlord able to remove it from your possession, you know, which, which has to be borne in mind. And the argument was that the local authority would be able to take over that function. So we know that the local authority's powers haven't been strong enough no, nor indeed do they have the men on the ground or women on the ground to, to keep up with it. Um, whereas the landlords covered particular areas and had an interest, and, and they did. <coughs> so, half these pictures are gone. This is a memory issue. Um, so, if you want to see what happened in uh, Renner and Rathmines, you can get this uh, presentation separately and see all the pictures, because there's four photographs of each of these examples, so you just have to take it from me. The top is vacant shop in Renner High Street. High value can be, uh, uh, you know, a high street. I mean, our tiny little shop is valued at 13,000 per annum under a new license with Dublin City Council, and it is no more than uh, what is it, three meters by 10 meters, 13,000 per annum. So you can imagine the value of, of this property that is kept vacant. I mean, one there, the uh, optician, I think has been empty for, the English would tell us, up to 10 years. We have the upper doors, years. lottery. 30. 30? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I can not have to 10. Um, and then you have things like, the ultra back, it is occupied on the ground floor, but the up, upper floor is empty, and there's going to be a lot of ultra banks um, looking for new tenants and new uses shortly. They could find marks out. <laughs> and those buildings on the left are part of the site, the local site, where we had, uh, Brenda Arts had its art centre. And we were, we were basically holding over a lot of property there for about seven years, and it was great. Uh, we got it originally through the local authority from Nama, but then it was sold to the developer and we had to get out. Mm -hmm. But it is still, the site is still undeveloped and no planning commission for it. Okay, I also want to talk about, except they're not here now, the large houses subdivided pre-63, many flats and so on. And you can see that I don't know about the conditions inside. I know they do provide housing for people who need that housing. I don't know what they have to pay for it. In some cases, probably quite reasonable, because many private bank landlords are reasonable, and others are not. Um, but you can see top on plastic and aluminium windows on heritage houses. One thinks that that wouldn't happen so much for private houses. In fact, if you look at private houses, that is rarer. So I had four private houses, big private houses, three stories, all vacant. In like at least half a million, at least more like a million vacant, run down. Now. In some cases, people just can't manage to maintain them. In other cases, um, that one, for instance, there is a planning commission for a large extension, and you can see the grass has grown entirely over the path. So that's years there, so it must be a speculative purchase. So there's many reasons why it happens, but it happens. So, oh no. Everything except the mill town path. But if you, this is a story, and you just have to leave me the story. And Maybe you may not have time for the story. Oh, okay. uh, then I won't. We'll just move on. Uh, you can come back to some of the thoughts. No, I just want to. Yeah, yeah, okay, we'll yeah. come back. It's so, really over time now. Oh, dear. Um, um, so, what have we learned? The, well, I'm saying, what is? The problem was never the landlord, the, that the ground rent, it was always the landlord that charged them. The ground rent is an excellent idea. So, what if a householder could sell a free to a landlord with a public purpose, like a community land trust? It could be a local authority, it could be a land development agency, but in this case, they're, they're not doing it. But we could do it with a community land trust that supported householder tenants' community heritage environment. Then the householder would have a control grade and renovate. The CLT could have electric decent design, specified plan permission, tenant contracts, OC works. Etc., which a lot of older owners don't have, and the power to ensure the affordability of the housing and related uses in perpetuity with its clauses. You essentially devalue the house by removing the ground from it, the ground rent, and it's such a powerful position that then you can control the resale value of those houses and ensure that it is sold on to people who have an equal amount of money or whatever purpose. That 
the community decide. And then we can make a strong case to GCC to permit <coughs> them, which these are, these are in many cases listed building, into two or three white sized apartments and the garages, kilometers of laneways with garages that could be used for artists. So, there are difficulties. The Grand Rent Street has high values, but, and it could be quite a lot of money, really, you know, hundreds of thousands, depends. Who will buy it? Institutions will pay for them. Particularly when you look at government bonds are now yielding negative returns. Very safe. It's, it's counterintuitive to think something with a very low rate of return can have a very high capital value, but its value is the first thing in it. Um, but they have to be absolutely secure. And why is it they are? That's because the landlord, whoever it is, has very, very strong power to, over to, to actually take over the entire property. But in other cases where you have community land trusts like in the, in the US, that is rarely if ever happened. It's actually more likely that the leaseholder who has a mortgage for the lease um, has trouble paying that a great deal more money, in which case the uh, community land trust acts as a mediator with the bank, which the bank much prefers, and they can usually handle and make some arrangement. So, they only want large ones and large uh, passive ground I think, and this is the biggest obstacle. We cannot do it alone. The old landlord had hundreds of ground rents, and there were new houses, they didn't have to do much to get the money, and um, we have to replicate that. So, and in our case, we're looking at a public purpose community landlord, so we're not going to sell a top dock off to investors whose motives are not coinciding with ours. So it might, it might be that we have to borrow, and it used to be a difficult problem. But that has changed in the same relatively recently because of the environmental and social governance goals that are now worldwide and particularly strong in Europe. They require that all EU institutions strictly support its goals to address climate change by diversity, loss, property, pollution, etc., etc., which is the same as public purpose. And that directive covers the Irish Strategic Investment Fund and the European Investment Bank. So, <coughs> at the moment, the ISIF, at the investment commercial base, but it has to prioritise housing and climate change to meet the standards. Those standards are not that onerous. I mean, I was horrified to see that a Finnish family fund, which means a really wealthy family, along with a wealth fund, were able to get that funding upfront capital from the ISIF and the rest at nothing percent from the European Investment Bank under Green New Deal to buy Irish forestry. And they did that by saying they were going to do continuous current forestry, what we should be doing anyway. So they are now busily buying up the uh, farmland in the west coast of Ireland that is coming to its, uh, coming near to the point where it would be felled and becomes worthless. So, I reckon we can do it as well. So um, we've benefited the French generation, the Dead generation, and the wealthy poor as I call them. Um, using this system, we could own our own home. The site would be held in common through a community land trust or other public purpose uh, landlord. Homeowners could reduce their debt, etc. Um, and shops could benefit as well when we have time. Why? Government needs strong evidence and workable of alternatives. It thinks, it genuinely thinks there is no alternative. And the reason is that the ECB caps, put caps on public borrowing, um, which restricts public investment in housing. That's the real reason why there isn't much social and low authority housing built directly. The Irish Bank caps. Um, restrict personal mortgages under the prudential um, lending rules. That's because they're terrified of overheating the housing market, which still hasn't reached the levels of 2008, and they're afraid it will go up again and crash. So, um, they also think that the uh, public would never accept raising residential property taxes to cool the market. And, there, and there, is, there is a reason for that, because many people have mortgages that more than their houses are worth. This is a problem that has to be dealt with, a strong political obstacle to making changes. And um, also believe that it's too complicated and slow to 
buying suburban areas or to bring native properties into the use, that central, bigger, faster, you know, the big stuff is faster and bigger, better, and there were a lot of people telling them that for the last 10 years. The lobbyists have been very busy. And the belief that the market is all knowing in the end of the day and its judgment must be accepted. Remember that we all parties. The unfortunate thing is that it's the next generation that is suffering for that. In so can that we probably move on? Can the rest of this be dealt with when we no, have the general panel? Okay, I just think it's it. That's it. I, can I just very quickly do the last one? Okay. So our message is, if you put public money into that and social housing and don't waste it on middle class people, and certainly the sentence for uh, farm investment, it will go further. That the bank caps are all right on the leaseholds, so the leaseholds now, as long as a ground rent landlord can take up the rest. So we can keep house price as it is without gently going upwards as the government wants. We can manage that. That um, <coughs> the building professionals and small medium sized builders are ready for the challenge of doing this. There's a lot of architects here, a lot of small builders, middle sized builders have been cut out of the market. Let us back in, please. Procurement rules have created, you know, very few actual practices or builders that actually been to work in the rest of the country. And in a democracy, finally, aka the electorate, of which generation rent will shortly form the largest segment. Mm -hmm. Those men, not the market. And they'll soon find out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this presentation, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so uh, just to emphasize, it's not the opinions of my employer, I'm a statistician, but I'm also a PhD student in the UC. So the context here is basically a paper I wrote for the uh, in a submission to the Commission on Taxation and Welfare, uh, the, um, they're currently sitting, and basically I have two objectives for this presentation. Firstly, to just give you an overview of the submission, and secondly, to link this into how this relates to making Dublin a better city. So, so it's a good place to start is to ask, well, what is a site value tax? Site value tax is a tax, uh, when you think about basically a property, a property can be kind of distilled into two components. One is uh, the building and the other built infrastructure uh, on the property, and the second is the site value. The, uh, that, that on which the, uh, the building and other capital assets sit. So a site value tax is a, a tax on the site that the building sits on. So it's, it has similarities to the vacant site tax or the zoned land tax, uh, but it's not exactly the same thing. So basically, the paper had a set of re a few recommendations. The first was to introduce a site value tax. How would you introduce a site value tax? Basically, you change the basis of commercial rates to site values. Um, you would also change the basis of the local property tax to site values. So currently, they're both um, basically levied on, on on full property values. The idea of, a site, of introducing site value tax would be that you change that to the site values. Secondly, you could transfer the responsibility for collecting commercial rates from local authorities to the revenue commissioners. And thirdly, to basically to really direct the work of the valuation office to create low rolling estimates of <coughs> both commercial um, rates and residential sites. Um, so currently the valuation office works on creating estimates of property tax, uh, sorry, on, of commercial, uh, va values of commercial property to create commercial rates. Um, so I, I, I just move on because time is tight. And when we come to questions, maybe you might have more questions about this. So there's plenty of literature on the topic in Ireland, um, particularly over the last 15 years. And it's quite varied in where it's coming from. There are academic papers. There's also uh, papers. Sorry, I'm sitting in front of the screen. Yeah, perhaps I have. Sorry about that. There, yeah, so there are academic papers. There's papers from, uh, I suppose, Irish government institutions. Also from uh, Antashka, which is an environmental um, charity and simply also from IBEC and the OCD. So quite a variety of areas. You might have also heard of the idea that Lady McWilliams often talks about in the Irish Times. I think there was an article last week about it. Um, so there's a lot of talk about this idea. Um, 
and it was one of the items that the Commission on Taxation were interested in getting feedback on. So, a big, uh, the context of this really, I suppose, relates to property prices, and I'll start with house prices, because we have more information on house prices uh, than commercial property prices. So, this chart here, I'll just talk you through it, basically, it's a set of indices, so that means basically they start at 100, and they match at 6, and uh, they go on until 2020. So there are a few different indices here, uh, and fortunately, <coughs> on this screen here, you can't see the bottom, but I can point out the lines to you physically. So the first one down here is, is a consumer prices. So this is inflation, what we talk, when you hear about inflation, this is what, what's, what it's about. So basically, if there was a good and it was worth, if there was a, basically the average product, if the average product was worth 100 euros back in 1996, today it would be worth about 150 euros, okay? Now the second one here we have this kind of yellow line, that is wages, average wages. So if the average person earned 100 euros in 1996, in 2020, they earn, um, they earn about 230 euros, okay? And then the third line here is, is this orange one, okay? That is rent, that's basically the price, average price of rent. So rent has gone up, if it was, if it was worth 100 euros then, it would be about just under 250 euros today. Okay, so basically, what these three lines tell you is prices have gone up, wages have gone up, rent has gone up. Basically, wages have gone up considerably more than, than overall products, which means basically people are better off than they were then. <coughs> buy, the average person can buy the average amount of goods, more of the average amount of goods now than they could then. If you compare it to rent, basically, the average person paying the average rent is paying more of their income on rent than they were back then. The final line on the top here is property prices. So this is actually the price of, of house prices, okay? And you can see basically two things here. Firstly, they went up enormously, and then they went down enormously. So you have basically enormous volatility in this, in this picture, in this gray line up here at the top. And, and, and secondly, they've gone up considerably more than any of the others, okay? Um, so they've gone up by, by 250%, so they're 350 relative to 200 back in 1996. Okay. Okay, so if you basically break this down, and you look, if you catch your mind back to that gray line that we just saw, and you look at it from 2006, I couldn't get the data the whole way back. But uh, basically, you can divide the, you can look, you can take house prices and you can divide them into, into two components. And those two components are what, the two things that I mentioned at the start. You basically the site value and the building on the site. Okay, so the site value is this orange bit here, and the building on the site is this blue bit. So this is, this refers to average house prices in Ireland. Um, so basically, what you can see from this chart is, is that for most years anyway, the site value is the larger component of the average house price. The second the second thing is is that site value is the largest driver in the change of house price over. And this is even more clear when you look at the change over time. So if you look at this chart, basically, in almost every year here, the, dr the driver of the change is site value. It's the contribution of this orange bit, not the blue bit, okay? So site values are quite important. Similarly, I, couldn't, I can't show you these same charts for commercial property prices. And um, commercial property prices being basically what uh, well, should be quite straightforward. But this is what we can tell because the data basically isn't available. But what we can tell is, is that commercial property prices in Ireland are very high, and the evidence, which I haven't done time to plot here, basically indicate that they follow a similar trend over the period. So basically, if you look at the cost of renting prime, a prime market years in Dublin uh, in quarter four 2018, it's it's higher than Milan, Amsterdam, Madrid, Berlin. So basically, the, the bottom line here is, is that property prices in Ireland are high, and for house prices, we know they're volatile, and for commercial property, the evidence suggests they're also volatile. So there's social consequences, I suppose, of high, high house prices. Um, so basically, high house prices mean that, being basically that households are paying more, on, on housing, and that's, yeah, houses are paying more on housing, which, which, which has an effect on, 
of what what even happened. Have said in other things. So here's a bit of evidence, I suppose, on, on what that might mean. So Corrigan and I, this is a paper by Corrigan, uh, own Corrigan works in the Department of Housing. Um, this is an analysis using 2016 data. So to some extent, it's out of date. The situation is probably worse than since, but I, I, I don't know. This is, anyway, the, the bottom line, from, well, sorry, a few points from this paper are that the bottom 25% of households they own 40% of their income on housing on it. So basically, that's a considerable amount of, of expenditure on housing. So this is basically a consequence of high house prices. And, and this is particularly the case, these, I suppose, those who spend high money, on high shares of their income on housing were private sector renters, people living in Dublin and the East, low income households. So there are basically social consequences from high property prices, volatile prices as well. There are also things that you wouldn't find basically from looking at this Cargan analysis, which is basically an analysis of affordability. And basically, people tend, tend it's not possible to essentially to to uh, to what was the word to to, to have un, have unaffordable housing for a long time because it's simply unaffordable. Um, so basically, what you see is is that young people are staying living at home for longer. So this is both the case. Ireland is a relatively high, how do I say, young, yeah, young people are living at home for longer in Ireland relative to other European countries, so the seventh highest in the EU, higher also than, than Ireland during the, the 2000s. And this basically improves the picture when you do uh, carbon analysis because basically more people, more people living in the same household boosts uh, income and, and reduces housing demand. And similarly, also, there's some other ameliorating factors. So basically, increased female labor market participation means a higher household income. There's been considerable government expenditure on rent. One in 10 euros, approximately, in 2019. That's probably increased since. And also, over 1.1 billion euros was spent on housing, social housing in 2019. And that also presumably increased considerably over the pandemic. There's also so, anyway, hopefully I'm okay. Right. Yeah, okay. Five minutes left. So, the economic consequences. Well, there's plenty of economic consequences, but hopefully these charts can give you some indication of this. So, basically, when you think about the economy, I suppose one straightforward forward way to think about the economy is, is the value of consumption. So, basically, the amount of money the average person spends uh, in a given year. So, you can look at how much does the average Irish person spend in a given year compared to other European countries, okay? So by this measure, this to some extent is a measure of, of wealth or basically purchasing ability. So if you were to look at basically, this chart here shows basically all the EU countries um, in, I mean, what's the year, it's 2019, um, so pre-pandemic basically, and Ireland compares quite well basically, Ireland is above the EU average for um, for uh, expenditure per capita, current price. But there's basically this is current price. So when you adjust for this is a price adjusted expenditure per capita, Ireland falls below the EU average. And the reason for this is basically because prices are higher than Ireland. So how high is high? Well, basically, if you plot the price level in the EU by country, consumer price level. Basically, you find that Ireland is the second highest. So basically, Ireland has a relatively high consumer expenditure. This is good. However, prices are very high, which means that you're basically not getting much money for, as much money for your expenditure as you might otherwise be getting. And it's very true to, 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 to say that high house prices is a big part of this. Why? Because basically, Cost of housing is a large part of household expenditure, specifically probably the, the largest single component. So this also has consequences for firms. Um, basically, firms basically also pay rent or they purchase buildings. High property prices means that they, they pay more in their intermediate uh, intermediate costs. And similarly, if if their workers have to pay a large amount of money in housing, well that reduces their competitiveness. It also means that new firms are less likely to enter the market because they're less likely to be property owners or less likely to 
um, to to have uh, to, to have be already renting a property from a, a long time, longer time in the past when uh, rents were lower, and it also diverts lending uh, from basically to the real estate sector and uh, and uh, to, to the real estate sector towards um, towards the financial sector similarly. So and basically away from other other types of of uh, activity in the economy. So how does this relate? So. My background is in urban planning, uh, or or anything like this. But so what I'm trying to do for these last two slides in the last two minutes is basically just try and link this in with the Devo Dublin Development Plan in Dublin. So basically, the Dublin Development Plan basically promises or aims to do lots of good things. So this is I just quoted a few things in the executive summary. Basically, capital city is where people choose to live, work, experience city living, invest, and socialize. Right? These are these are some of the things basically. The plan tries to do to basically to make the Dublin more green uh, and to make the city more compact, more vibrant, more distinct in character. The difficulty that I suppose the, the, the council will have, I suppose, in trying to achieve these things is, is that it has considerable powers to, I suppose, prevent certain developments from happening. So, for example, one of the things mentioned in the development plan is how the council can prevent gambling shops in certain locations. And there's obviously considerably more things the council can do than that, like the zoning. Um, but that is limited tools to ensure that possible developments take place. So, like, it certainly can provide carrot. So, the Living City Initiative is something that, that is, is, is a, a carrot that basically, it basically provides expertise uh, to people to do some of the things uh, that, that Duncan mentioned and, and, and Derek mentioned as well, basically, to. To, to do things like living over the shop and, and re um, how would I say um, renovate buildings, but they would really stick to encourage this to happen. If someone isn't prepared or isn't interested in doing that kind of development, well, it won't happen. So a site planning tax can basically help by by basically encouraging sustainable land use by basically creating cost on and. Um, by, by, yeah, by basically, basically creating, creating a cost associated with the economic potential of a site. So if you have a shop, uh, it's in a prime location, well basically the tax you would pay is on the, is associated with the potential for that, for that shop, uh, the economic potential of that shop. Um, and basically it would be costly as a result to leave sites vacant or underutilized. And a big part of that, that distinctive chart that you will remember from the start of this presentation, that basically um, is associated with speculation. Um, and basically a side value tax deter discourages speculation because it's because to hold land out of use is costly. You can't just hold it and speculate on it, you have to do something with it. So that pushes the price of, of land, land down and uh, basically increases, increases the intensity of use in the central locations where you want it to happen. So basically, in summary, I think I'm two minutes over time, basically, we have high and volatile property prices in Ireland, that also applies for Dublin. It's driven by site values. Site value tax can help because basically it taxes site values. And, and Dublin basically is affected by a few challenges. There's infrastructural needs, and it also relates to vacant and underutilized properties. <coughs> Site value tax can help that. How? Well, basically, because it discourages underuse of properties. And it can recoup infrastructure creation as well, because if good infrastructure is created, it, incre it increases site values, allowing the council to potentially recoup that um, money. So that's it. Thank you very much.